We've been working towards a lambda mu rho formulation of the seismic data using amplitude variation with offset uh, observations uh, and common reflect ideally common reflection point gathers. And uh, these these relationships over here at the left, you know, when you collect your data, this is NMO corrected. So the reflection event has been flattened and we're looking at the amplitudes of the reflected P wave at a particular time T and offset distance uh, X across the source receiver offset and um, we have to convert this these offsets into incidence angles which we could refer to as angles theta 1 through theta n and we can use a relationship like this, uh, which uh, uh, Russell uh, refers to. And um, also, just note that while we often say amplitude variation with offset, we're you know we're all, we're actually referring to amplitude variation with angle. And uh, we're doing the kind of analysis that we have down here. Uh, this uh, reflected P wave amplitude, some particular time t sub i and um, incidence angle theta. We're doing that throughout the duration of our observations as t sub i goes from some minimum value to some maximum value. And we have theta going from, depending on the fold of the data and the um, uh, separation between traces. Uh, we're carrying out this uh, analysis over a range of thetas and a range of times. And when we look at this particular formation here again, which uh, comes from Fatih et al., uh, we have terms r sub p, r sub s, and r sub d, which are going to allow us to come up with uh, values for lambda rho and uh, mu rho, the LAME parameters uh, in combination with the densities. And, uh, now, you remember that we have, uh, you know, this n trace gather, and uh, we have this relationship here that we just, you know, we just, we just noted between the reflection um, amplitudes of the P wave at a certain time and with theta. And uh, so we have this relationship here, and we'll, we'll kind of come back and talk about what these, remind you of what these coefficients are in a minute. But we can express this in a matrix form where we have the reflected P wave at a particular time T sub i, which is constant throughout this, um, th throughout the terms in this vector here. And then we have theta 1 going from, or theta going from theta 1 to theta n over the range of offsets in the, uh, in the gather. And over here we have the coefficients, uh, but we're subscripting them now and uh, indicating that they're subscripts that occur at a particular time for a particular angle, time t sub i, angle theta 1, t sub i, theta 2, and, uh, or theta, theta 1, and then c, coefficient c, uh, again for theta 1 at time t sub i. And then we have these different terms, which are also subscripting. Uh, this would be the P wave reflectivity, shear wave reflectivity, density reflectivity, at a particular time, t sub i. And then this would just be a simple matrix representation of what we see up here. So where we're identifying these matrices with a little hat on top. So this uh, relationship gets inverted and we're after these terms. So this is what, these are the terms that we want to determine in this relationship here. We don't know what they are yet, so we have to go through this inversion process in order to get uh, uh, these uh, different reflectivities. Now, over here, just as a reminder, we're working with this relationship. Um, we've got these constants. I'm just kind of simplifying some notation that you see in the literature, but basically A, B, and C, and um, referencing them by the time uh, with a subscript i and then the angle subscript one so i one this would be one plus tan squared theta one uh, b sub i one would be equal to minus eight uh, times the average shear wave over the average 
P wave, compression wave velocity squared for a saturated medium times the sine squared of theta 1 and then the last constant in this expression uh, at uh, for angle theta 1 you know, this where theta goes from 1 to n and we're just taking a look at a particular time i and uh, angle 1 be 4 times this ratio of the average shear to compression wave velocity squared for again for a saturated uh, medium times the sine squared of theta 1 minus the tan tangent squared of theta 1. So we estimate uh, theta j as noted earlier where theta j uh, can be expressed in terms of the interval velocity over the uh, two-way travel time times the RMS velocity squared. So uh, and we you know we realize that these uh, interval and RMS velocities are going to be time dependent as well. So it's additional information that we need. So we invert these uh, observations using the Marquardt-Levinson uh, algorithm, as we you know, talked about in one of the videos. So this is our starting point over here. And uh, after inversion of the observations, we have a series of n coefficients here instead of three um, for each of the angles, um, one through n. And then we have the three unknowns over here, r sub p, r sub s, and r sub d, at a particular time, t sub i. So we're now able, once we go through this uh, inversion process, uh, we are using that uh, Marquardt-Levenberg -Leven um, algorithm, we're, we're now able to estimate the acoustic impedances, uh, i sub p or z sub p, i sub s or z sub s, and, and the uh, density impedance, or uh, z sub d. <coughs> So in that, that order. So we talked about the inversion process. We, we talked about the synthetic seismogram, uh, the reflectivity sequence, the convolution of the wavelet with the reflectivity sequence would give us our uh, seismic response. And we could work backwards from our observed seismic response to get the impedances. Uh, where Z2, the next impedance here, would be equal to Z1 times 1 plus R1, this reflection coefficient, over 1 minus R1. And then we're going to continue using a Z instead of I, and we'll also shift over to the use of the capitalized R sub P, just you know, being consistent with this, uh, the terms in this equation here. So we have uh, Z sub P for uh, at time n would be equal to z sub p at time t1 times the product of all these 1 plus r sub p at time t sub i, uh, where i is running from 1 to n minus 1 over 1 minus r sub p t sub i. So this is uh, that recursive inversion um, relationship that we talked about, and um, we're going to be able to get the uh, uh, the reflectivities in this case r sub p would be the compressional wave reflectivity at a particular time t sub i and we're, we're getting all this information from our observations the abo observations so so we have this uh, basic uh, recursive relationship again we're using this notation z sub p at uh, t sub i is equal to z sub p at t time t sub i minus one times uh, one plus r sub p t sub i minus 1 over 1 minus r sub p at time t sub i minus 1. We, we could do this for any of the reflectivities on the, um, on the right hand uh, side of this, uh, of this equation. So we have r sub p's, we've determined what the r sub p's are for all times, the r sub s's and the r sub d's, so we should be able to, to determine the uh, <clears throat> shear wave impedance, the density impedance as well as the uh, compression wave um, impedance as a function of uh, our observation time uh, throughout the length of our gather. So now that we have these impedances, uh, they've been determined uh, you know, through this, this uh, process that we went through here. I had thought about presenting a Taylor series approximation to some of this, but it uh, didn't really look too simple, so I've kind of abandoned the idea, but, but this, this 
gives you a sense of where these impedances and how they how these impedances can be derived and so we've gone through this inversion uh, process uh, kind of in a two-step inversion process and we now have these uh, impedances remember in some formulations the compression wave impedance is referred to as ai and the shear wave impedance is si and uh, we're just uh, you know we've we've been looking at different reformulations of the zopritz equations and this is just one reformulation of that uh, relationship so so these formulations are an outgrowth of the avo analysis that uh, you know russell pro provides a nice uh, summary of this and uh, lambda rho and mu rho are derived from the impedances as follows where we have lambda rho is equal to the square of the compression wave impedance minus two times the square of the shear wave impedance and um, mu rho is equal to the square of the shear wave impedance and then here we're just showing these with different notations so in some places you might see this as i sub p squared minus 2 s sub, 2 i sub s squared or mu rho equal to i sub s squared and also in this form where lambda rho might be shown as uh, the compression wave acoustic impedance a i squared minus 2 times the shear wave impedance s i squared and mu rho would be equal to s i the shear wave impedance squared so we so we now have this information and uh, We've talked about its potential utility um, in unconventional reservoirs. The lower lambda, lambda rho mu rho responses are often associated with the gas bearing zone, in this case, the gamma ray, the high gamma ray. Also corresponds to a high TOC region. And over here, we're looking at gas sands. And we can see that uh, we get a decrease in lambda rho and an increase in mu rho, which is telling us uh, the increase in mu rho here is telling us something about the absence of fluid. And here we have the presence of fluid, so uh, which is which is being depleted because we have increase, increased gas content. So this can be used for exploration purposes, both in um, gas sands as well as in unconventional uh, reservoirs. And here we have again a kind of a repeat of that plot. And I just kind of want to note over here. So now I've plotted the data lambda rho mu rho uh, versus TOC. And you can see that this is the high TOC region. And this is all from well log data. So these are data observations that are made at 0.5 or a half foot intervals. And when we're looking at the data in seismic, if we go through this inversion process and then uh, you know, look at our look at our seismic data in this lambda rho mu rho format, and perhaps cross plot it, or you know, just look at variations within an interval of uh, lambda rho and mu rho. We're, we have to to readjust our perspective to be thinking in terms of the more smoothed uh, character of the seismic data. So in this area here, we have a well defined, fairly well defined. Uh, high TOC region, which is down in here, but you can see that it does get stretched out by smoothing, uh, the smoothing of the seismic wavelet. So what we see in the log data, we may not see necessarily as a continuous, may appear as a continuous interval, but may not really be continuous uh, in the seismic. So we have to come back and remind ourselves of uh, uh, the different aspects, the, the complexity of the subsurface, the difference in the resolution limits of our well log data and our seismic data are going to give us different views of lambda rho mu rho uh, in, the, in the subsurface. And that's just an important thing to keep in mind. So as we, we've pretty much wrapped up our ABO discussions for now, and um, you know here in this plot we're seeing Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio uh, uh, contours superimposed on lambda rho and mu rho. And again, just a reminder here that uh, we're, our observations are influenced by the um, characteristics of the seismic wavelet that we're using. So I hope these, um, hope these videos on the AVO topic have been useful. And uh, any comments and subject, suggestions on 
Future topics, topics are appreciated, and uh, you may want to see more on basic reflection and refraction, refraction seismology. Uh, let me know. And uh, thanks for joining us, and see you next time.